Hi there and welcome back. My name is Bonola Mukwazi and I will be taking you through our next exciting talk on plants and photosynthesis. In our hierarchy of models, we are sitting at number five, where we are now considering how oxygen, carbon cycles and other life forms make Earth habitable. We will be looking at plants, how they originated, evolved, what photosynthesis is, how it makes Earth habitable by bringing oxygen into the mix, how climate change affects plants and their biodiversity and what makes South Africa special. So what are plants? Plants are simply living organisms that make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. And it's for this reason that they are also called primary producers. In Origins of Life, we learned that primordial earth did not have oxygen. Amazing Water taught us that life began in the ocean, but why the ocean? Well, if there was no oxygen, then there was no ozone layer to protect life on Earth's surface. But the ocean can actually shield out the harsh UV radiation for oceanic life to thrive. This brings us to the earliest known photosynthetic organisms to produce oxygen, which are the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. The cyanobacteria are the only photosynthetic prokaryotes which are able to produce oxygen. And these occurred at about 2.7 billion years ago. Because oxygen was previously unknown, it caused the first mass extinction on Earth, as anaerobic life failed to adapt to oxygen. And this event is also known as the oxygen catastrophe or the great oxygenation event. As oxygen got deposited into the seabed, it reacted with dissolved iron uh, to form iron oxides. And oxygen accumulated with the reaction of carbon, ferrous iron, and other organic minerals. It is believed that when the oceans became permanently oxygenated, the small variations in oxygen production formed periods of free oxygen in the surface waters, alternating with periods of iron oxide deposition. Hence, we see banded iron formations appear as alternating layers of iron oxides and other iron poor sediments. So when the ocean became completely oxygenated, the excess oxygen escaped into the atmosphere and the atmospheric oxygen eventually formed the ozone layer. And now that there was an ozone layer to shield out the harsh UV radiation, terrestrial life became possible. That means even plants could seek out new territories and evolved into land plants. Just to give more context as to when did this evolution occur. Okay. On the y-axis, the millions of years ago that the different types of plants evolved. And you could um, just go through this at another time. Plants have different classifications. We did not hear about C3, C4, and um, CAM plants, which is a classification based on how plants metabolize carbon dioxide and water to give off oxygen and carbohydrates. But we'll learn about this in uh, the later slides. But for now, let's look into photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is simply a process through which plants use sunlight energy to produce nutrients from carbon dioxide and water. Photosynthesis is divided between light dependent and light independent or Kelvin cycle reactions. And it's this process that facilitates the growth and health of plants and also makes possible the process of carbon fixation or sequestration. We also have three different uh, metabolic pathways that we will shortly learn about. And at the bottom there is the equation of uh, photosynthesis, what goes in and what comes out. The factory house, and that is the leaf, where the whole process of photosynthesis happens. In the mesophile cells, we have chloroplasts, which contain the pigment chlorophyll that gives leaves the green color. Chlorophyll absorbs light energy and the stomata that is responsible for taking in carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen. So as I've highlighted that photosynthesis has two sets of reactions the light reactions and the Kelvin reactions, these occur in different regions of the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contain stacks of membrane-linked lined discs that are called thylakoids. These are surrounded by a watery clear fluid called the stroma. The light reactions are carried out by molecules in the thylakoid membranes and the Kelvin cycle by molecules in the stroma. In the thylakoid membranes, the light reactions transform light energy to chemical energy. 
So light energy drives the formation of ATP molecules from ADP and the formation of NADPH from NADP+. And along the way, the water molecules are split and oxygen is formed. In the stomata, the Kelvin cycle reactions use the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH to combine carbon dioxide to form new molecules like sugar. So ADP and NADP plus are recycled and may be used again in the light reactions. So a plant then increases its biomass through the formation of these new organic molecules. Now we learn about carbon fixation and what's the fuss around this whole process. It is simply the conversion of inorganic carbon to organic compounds and this happens during the Kelvin cycle. And depending on whether it's a C3, C4 or a CAM plant, it will be either the Rubisco or the Pepco enzymes that are responsible for this conversion of these compounds. And carbon fixation simply facilitates the transfer of carbon between the various carbon pools that we have on, in the environment, be it the ocean, land, atmosphere, or living organisms. Carbon is fixed differently in various photosynthesis pathways, and we'll learn about this shortly. So we have C3, C4, and CAM plants that uh, have different ways of metabolizing or fixing carbon. Plants that undergo C3 photosynthesis begin the Kelvin cycle by producing a three carbon compound called the three phosphate lysyric acid, hence the C3 abbreviation. C3 photosynthesis is a one stage process that takes place inside the mesophyll cells, as you can see here. And about 85% of plants on Earth use this type of photosynthesis. C4 photosynthesis, on the other hand, is a two staged process, as you can see here, that produces a four carbon intermediate compound within the mesophyll cells. Once created, the plant pumps that intermediate compound into the thick walled uh, bundle CFL cell, this one here, that splits the compound into carbon dioxide and a three ca uh, carbon compound. So then the carbon dioxide then undergoes the Kelvin cycle in here as it would in C3 photosynthesis. So the benefit of C4 photosynthesis is that it produces a higher concentration of carbon, making C4 for organisms more adept at surviving in habitats with low light and water. But better yet are the CAM plants. CAM is an abbreviation of Crassulacian acid metabolism. This type of photosynthesis, organisms absorb light energy during the day and then use the energy to fix carbon molecules during the night. As you could see in the diagram here, so uh, in other words, during the day, the organism's stomata is closed up to resist dehydration while the carbon dioxide from the previous night undergoes the Kelvin cycle. Chem photosynthesis allows plants to survive in arid climates, and therefore it is the type of photosynthesis that is used by most desert plants. Well, not just desert plants, but even pineapples use chem photosynthesis. So this table shows the four key differences between C3, C4, and chem plants. C3 is the only one that uses the Rubisco enzyme, whereas C4 and CAM use Pepco enzymes. The optimum temperature for CAM is the highest as it can thrive beyond 35 degrees Celsius. CAM is also very water use efficient, hence it can survive in arid climate uh, conditions. So speaking of climate, a bunch study amongst many found that um, a rise in temperature could actually affect the rate of photosynthesis and respiration. As you could see on your y-axis, we have the rate and temperature on the x-axis. So this study made an experiment with original wheat seeds to see how um, carbon dioxide affects um, plant growth. And in the current condition, they used ambient carbon dioxide and a high nitrogen concentration which shows growth, but with the projected future conditions where there's a high carbon dioxide and a high nitrogen content, there was little to no growth. Now we've reached a point where we talk about our special country and what makes it so special. South Africa is the only country in the world that has its own floral kingdom. It is rich in plant and habitat biodiversity, 
We have fruit and vegetables. We have medicinal plants. We have beautiful views driving across Namakwa land. And we have a thriving tourism economy. I mean, who doesn't want to come and see this beauty that we have here? So to conclude our talk today, we could simply say life on Earth is owed to cyanobacteria. And sunlight is an important energy source for primary producers and the entire food chain. Plants regulate carbon pools and fluxes through the carbon cycle, but climate change affects plant biodiversity drastically. South Africa's biodiversity actually makes it a great place to study ecosystems. But let me not brag, you stay tuned for the next talk that will teach you more about biodiversity.